Side Hustle Show 284, from active income to passive income. What's up, what's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because happy shouldn't be confined to an hour. I'm excited to introduce you to Abby Ashley from the virtualsavvy.com. Over the past several years, Abby has taken her business from freelancing as a virtual assistant while on maternity leave, actually, to building an agency with other VAs working under her to teaching others how to start their own VA business. It's the side hustle path, right? From freelance to agency to product. And during that time, Abby went from making 25 bucks an hour when she was first starting out to earning eight grand in pre-sales when she first launched her product, all the way up to $160,000 for each of her last couple of launches from one to one to one to many. Awesome story with some incredible and inspiring results. Stick around to hear how Abby walked this path, her actionable hacks and strategies along the way, and how she's built and sold her online course even without a huge audience starting out. Notes and links for this one, along with a free PDF highlight reel summary with all of Abby's top tips from the call, are at sidehustlenation.com slash Abby, A-B-B-E-Y. Now, Abby is a hustler who wasn't afraid to take chances and make things happen, but she still had a lot to learn about running an online business. And that's where our sponsor, Skillshare.com, comes in. Skillshare is the online learning community with over 20,000 classes in marketing, business, social media, and tons more. Basically, any skill you need to get your side hustle off the ground or take it to the next level. These are practical, on-demand classes taught by industry experts and insiders. And how about this? Side Hustle Show listeners get two months of unlimited access for just 99 cents. Hit up Skillshare.com slash side hustle to claim that deal. Again, check it out at Skillshare.com slash side hustle. So one smart thing that Abby did that you'll hear in this call is she sold her product before going through the effort of making it. Now, what if you could do the same thing with physical products? Basically, take the inventory risk out of the equation, right? Well, that's what dropshipping allows you to do. And if you visit dropshiplifestyle.com slash hustle, you'll find a free dropshipping toolkit put together by Side Hustle Show alum Anton Crayley and his team over there. The toolkit includes 187 dropshipping niche ideas, Anton's niche selection guide, access to his free 10-day dropshipping mini course, and more. Big thank you to Dropship Lifestyle for sponsoring this episode. Once again, check it out at dropshiplifestyle.com slash hustle. I'll be back with my top takeaways from the chat with Abby after the interview. Ready? Let's do it. I've never really been a very good employee, I don't think. I've always just had this entrepreneurial spirit. So I was about to have my first daughter and I thought I just can't go back to work to a job that I hate. I can't put my kid in daycare to go to a job that I hate, basically. (laughs) Like that just did not settle well with me. And so a couple months before her due date, I started looking into work from home opportunities. And a friend of mine mentioned virtual assistants. I had never heard of it before, but I scoured the internet. I read every outdated blog post and ebook and YouTube video. And I just devoured everything there was online. And I just thought, I think I could do this. You know, I had admin experience, nothing. I never worked really virtually in a service based environment. But I thought, you know, I just I really think that I could do some of at least these general admin skills. And so I am an all or nothing kind of person. And so I threw up a website, I actually paid somebody like 50 bucks to make a website for me. I created business cards. I made a list of services. And I started going to local networking meetings and I was able to get clients actually pretty quickly just telling my friends and family what I was doing. It's, it's amazing when you just start telling people what you're doing and your new business adventure. I think that most of us just get like scared if we're going to start something new, like, Oh, is this just going to be another thing that I do and don't follow through with or whatever. And I was like, I'm going to tell people about this. And even my friends that weren't business owners, most everyone knows at least one business owner. So word began to spread and the local networking and, you know, telling friends and family, I got clients to the point where I actually didn't have to go back to work. After my maternity leave, I was working about 15 to 20 hours a week doing client work. And that was enough to replace my income from my full-time job. Wow. That's awesome. Congratulations on that. I love the hustle to make that happen while eight months pregnant. And then, you know, while on maternity leave, we were not getting anything done during those first few months of our son's life. So 
probably envious of you, of you there. It's not what I advise people to do, but for me, it really did put that like, you know, fire under my butt. Like I'm going to make this happen. And I was very lucky that my first daughter was very mild mannered. She was like the easiest baby ever. She slept all the time. So I was kind of bored. So it kind of just worked out that way. This definitely wouldn't have happened the same way if it was my son. So I'll just throw that out there too. Yeah. No, no moms want to talk to you anymore. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> A couple of things that I wanted to unpack there. The first was telling friends and family about this. So this is something that you mentioned people are kind of hesitant to do because it's like you're really sticking your neck out there and saying, well, you know, who am I to offer this kind of service? Who am I to, to go into business for myself, right? It's like it's a very scary thing to do. But in doing so, you kind of tap into your network's network. Like you said, not all your friends were business owners, but they likely knew somebody else who might be in need of that kind of service. And you weren't looking for anything crazy. Hey, you said 15, 20 hours a week. That was enough to get the business off the ground and go to town with it. The other thing that I wanted to ask you about was this like, okay, these were skills that you'd gotten paid for in the past, or you just like, you said, hey, I can figure it out or I can do it. Like what gave you the confidence to start that business? I think I had found some article. It was probably an article of like what a virtual assistant could do for you, like geared more toward people hiring virtual assistants. I started reading through some of the tasks. I'm like, I can do that stuff. And so things like data entry, making appointments, setting calls, calendar management, answering customer service emails, even just writing. I do like to write. I've always liked to write. So I just thought, I could do this. I discovered Canva and instantly I thought I was the world's greatest graphic designer. And I just started, I started really just with the tasks that I knew. I didn't get overwhelmed with all of the software. And, and it was amazing. Once I started getting clients, people would say, okay, you know, I'll have you do this and this, you know, A, B, and C. And I knew how to do A and B, but I didn't know how to do C. They would be like, okay, that's fine. I can show you how to do that. And I really just, learned as I went along. So I started learning more and more programs, more and more, you know, tech skills, just as I got clients, and they they kind of showed me the ropes as I was getting paid to do so. So that was awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. Was it a proactive outreach, like at these networking events saying, hey, I can help you with X, Y, and Z, or just kind of came up over the course of conversation? Like, hey, do you need help with whatever admin tasks? I'm just curious, like, because you're, you're not mentioning like, oh, I saw a job listing on Upwork or Craigslist or something, and I bid on the job. Right. And I mean, I eventually did transition a little bit more into looking for online work, which I could definitely speak to as well. But I think that we, a lot of times we go straight to that, like service-based providers just go straight to looking for jobs on Upwork or in Facebook groups. And there is a lot more competition there where when I would go to a local networking event and I said, I'm a virtual assistant, it's almost like people would flock to me because they're all businesses like trying to just... They're not really there to help one another, maybe in the way of leads, but not as far as like services towards one another. And so when I would go to local networking events, they would just, they heard that I could help them with some of their tasks that they were spending five, 10 hours a week doing instead of working with clients or instead of getting more service. It was just like, oh my goodness, I need that. You know, like I didn't even have to really prove that I was good at it. It was just like, oh, we need to talk. It's okay, let's talk. So I think that that again paired with just the friends and family because hands down, I mean, word of mouth marketing, I still think is, has been, will be, for, will forever be the most powerful form of marketing. Because if you hear something from a friend, you hear something from a family member, somebody says, oh, you should check this out. It's just immediately that much more reputable to you. So I eventually did, you know, once I got more skills and I started looking for more clients because I got subcontractors to work for me as well, I started, I discovered, you know, finding group groups in Facebook or finding groups in LinkedIn that had entrepreneurs in them as well. And so people would say that they need help. One of my little tips is that I'll go to a Facebook group that has entrepreneurs in it and I'll search for the word virtual assistant, VA, maybe some of the services. So like content, or if you specialize in Pinterest, you can search for the word Pinterest. Another thing, you can search for the word help or hire because people will say, I need help with my blog or I'm looking to hire someone. So all, you know, I would search for those and then do a really, really value-based proposal, you know, like reach out to them, shoot them a video, 
or provide something up front for them to really try to make me stand apart from the crowd. And I really think that that once I did start transitioning to getting more clients online, I think that that really helped me in that space as well. Yeah, I love it. That's a great way to go about it. Kind of meeting, it means marketing 101, right? Like meeting your customers in their natural habitat, but doing it in a pretty creative way. I like that one. Okay, so you so go about you're starting out freelancing hours for dollars doing this thing, you bring it on subcontractors underneath you. So you're kind of building out an agency as your own capacity kind of reaches its ceiling. What happens next? Do you kind of get in? Or are you thinking, okay, I'm going to build a 50 person agency or do you take a different path? For most of 2014, I because I started all of this in 2013. A lot of 2014, I really just enjoyed the ride, to be honest. Like I was like, I am at the park with my kid. And I'm making money because some subcontractor is working. And that was awesome. So I did enjoy that for a while. And then I actually started working for some other course creators, got into that whole realm and realized that I could package knowledge and sell it as a course. And the whole idea just seemed really awesome to me. I just thought that that could fit really well for my personality. So in late 2015, early 2016, I decided I did what I actually don't recommend most people do. I do a lot of things I don't recommend other people to do, but hey, it's part of my story. I was like, I'm going to create courses. Like I just got this brilliant idea at 3 a.m. I'm going to Because these were the people you happen to be connecting with in these Facebook groups. Like those were the people who were like, I need a VA. They were yes. course creators or online entrepreneur type people. Okay. Yes. And so I, I started just getting more into the online space and saw that people were just doing really well with creating online courses. And I thought I could do that too. And so I actually dropped my agency. I literally was like, I'm again, I go all in, right? So I'm like, I'm told all my clients, Hey, I'm going to be phasing out of work over the next 30, 60 days. I'm going to start creating courses. This is what they're going to be about. And they're going to be awesome. And they were really generalized. They were not super specific. Like I think I had a branding course and a blogging course and I had all these course ideas. And I spent three months creating these courses, slowly getting rid of my clients. And I launched them early 2016. I launched these courses and crickets. It was bad. We're actually like in the process of buying a house right now. And they are looking at like the past year's taxes. And they're like, we noticed that you made no money in 2016. I'm like, yes, because I didn't. It was bad. And so I did a lot of crying and a lot of like, what do I do? The problems were I, I didn't really build an audience. I had a list, I had an email list of mm, probably like 800 email subscribers that I'd slowly started getting over the years of doing a VA agency, mainly just because people said you need to have a list. I'm like, okay, I'll have a list. And so, so who's, I, who's on that list? Is that other VAs or who is that? Oh, it is that was customers? A hodgepodge. I'll be honest, I don't even know. <laughs> like, who was on that list? It was clients, it was friends and family. It was, you know, I, I wrote a little ebook called How to Get Clients Using LinkedIn. And I would promo it in a couple of Facebook groups and things like that on um, like the little promo threads and people would slowly join my list. So again, it took, it took, I guess, like three years to get that list because it was just kind of in the background going really slowly. Okay. You weren't actively like blogging, doing the content creation uh, I'd write, thing. I'd write blogs a few times. I wrote a few blogs, but they didn't really gain a whole lot of traction at the time. So 800 people on accident found your found their way to your email list, on which is not that's not small. So it did take time. But yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I don't want to like scoff at that at all because I know that that's huge. And if I would have actually paid attention, I probably could have made a lot of money from that list. So that was the problem: is that I just thought, oh, I'm going to teach them what I think they need to know, or you know, what I think I'm best at which is okay to teach that. But I didn't really ask my audience what they wanted to learn. I just said, here's what I'm going to teach you. And so I launched these courses. I had spent months creating them. And I think I had one guy buy at $97. So thanks to that one guy. <laughs> Enjoy your course. And I was just like, you know, especially having let go of so much, it was just okay, what do I do now? And, and 2016 was a really like soul searching year. Like, do I still want to be an entrepreneur? Do I, you know, like, should I go back to the old agency? I still really want to do courses. I was starting to get a little burnout on client work. 
So I got actually, I got a few more clients because, hey, I needed money and I knew how to do that well. I knew how to get clients. So I grabbed a few more clients and started working again and still just devoting a lot of time to trying to figure out what I was going to do. I actually stumbled upon a podcast in fall of 2016 about discovering your niche. And it was so funny because I had hired a business coach. I had really like done so much soul searching and this one stinking free podcast, like totally just made me think I just need to teach or like I need to ask my audience and teach what I'm actually good at, like what's I, what I've had success at. So rather than creating courses, I had the idea, I didn't just say, you know, what do you want to learn in general to my email list? I said, Hey, I have this idea for creating a virtual assistance course. I created this agency. I was able to quit my job doing virtual assistance. I thought up what like the modules for the course would be. I just kind of listed them out. And I asked if anyone was interested in that topic. If so, I was going to sell the course at a lower price. It was about half the price around, I think it was like four or $500 where I knew eventually the course would be probably a $900,000 product. I said, Hey, you can get in early. And I had about 16 people buy from my list of a thousand. So I made $8,000 from doing that tactic. Just asking people before I even created the course, is this something you would want to learn? Here's the modules. Jeez. Okay. So you outlined it. So you didn't spend the three months, you know, creating and filming the whole thing, but you outlined it. And then you sent it on email like, Hey, this is something that I'm thinking of building. If you want to get in for half price or whatever, the beta launch team, whatever, how you want to, want to structure it, click here and buy now. Mm-hmm. That was worth eight grand versus one sale at $97 before. Mm-hmm. And I think the whole idea of beta, like I've totally flipped my idea of what a beta should be because I ran a beta with my other courses. I got like 50 people to sign up and say they would take the course for free. And I was like, does anyone want to take my course for free? And I got 50 people to do that. I just thought, oh my gosh, this course is going to be wildly successful because people want my course. Well, all it validated is that people would take something free from me. It didn't validate that people would actually pay me money for the topic that I wanted to teach. So the second launch, this new course, this virtual assistant course, I validated it before I created it. I, you know, I validated that people would actually pay me money for the topic that I wanted to teach. And I think that that was the game changer. Was that... A single email? Was that a concerted launch sequence? How, tell me a little bit more about that pre-launch validation phase. I mean, it was kind of a ghetto version because it was really just emails. <laughs> but I had read about doing like a problem agitate solve, like that whole method. So I sent out three emails, like kind of talking about like the pain points of making money from home. And then offered my course as a solution. And I made sure to add in like some scarcity and urgency. So I had a couple bonuses that would expire. And then I like closed the cart. So I said, you know, past this Friday, you won't be able to get the course until I launch it again in six months. Okay. And then that was to give you time to build it out <laughs> for, for these people. Yeah, it was to give me time to actually make it. And I was like, oh, Lord, I hope not just like one person buys and I'm, you know, if that would have happened, I probably would have like rethought and repackaged, asked my audience, okay, what is it that you do want to learn if that would have happened? But luckily it didn't. Yeah, I was going to ask if there was a, a number in your head that you were shooting for. And it's like, okay. Eight grand from a thousand person email list. Like, obviously, this is something that you need to create. You know, this is something that they desperately want, but it's like kind of the middling numbers. And it's like, okay, if one person buys, eh, maybe not. But if it's like, oh, I got five, you know, is that good? It's, I, that's where I'm kind of in the, in the middle where it's like, you have to kind of see the vision, see the future, where you want to go and be like, well, I'm going to build this anyways, because it's something that I think I can continue to fill the funnel for. Yeah, definitely. At that point, what was the tech behind the email service provider, the shopping cart, the membership platform, that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. All that fancy stuff. I think I sent a PayPal link. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any of that. Much. <laughs> I wrote a lot of emails and I said, stuff is going away. And really, that just meant I wasn't going to send the link out again. Like I don't, Or maybe I, I don't know. 
oh, if someone wanted to buy it after, I probably would have been like, of course you can. Here you go. But yeah, it was really, really simple. In fact, I created kind of like a sales page in just a Google Doc. Like it was I'd like a fun little picture. And then I listed out what all the modules would be in a description, almost like an actual sales page would be, but it was just in a Google Doc. And so um, then I decided to create a course in Teachable. So at that point, I invested pretty much most of that money into just getting myself set up to be like a real business owner. At that point, I was starting to blog a little bit more too. So I hired somebody to do Pinterest for me and I started using an online course platform. So that was was teachable for the courses? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I love teachable. Who are you using for email? ConvertKit. Gosh, I love the sales page in the Google Doc. Like, oh, dude, you literally have no excuses. Everybody can open this up. You can format it however you want. You can put in your pictures. You can put the little PayPal link down at the bottom. That is a great hack. It was pretty ghetto, but hey, it worked. You got it. You got to work with what you have, right? <laughs> and I had no money but creativity. So that's what we went with. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Okay. So you get the eight grand in pre-sales. You build the course. And I imagine you're dripping out modules over the time or you're just like, hey, you're kind of waiting to give people access until it's all done? No, I drifted out. So that actually helped me was I created a schedule for everyone. So they knew when the modules were going to be released. And I knew I would release about a module a week. There were 12 modules. So over the course of three months, I was able to give them the entire course. So I gave them a schedule, which actually was more for my benefit because it kept me on schedule to actually deliver the lessons and the modules by then. Okay. So what happens next? Because this is kind of a problem that some other side hustlers have run into. It's like, okay, I did this pre-sale validation thing. I launched, I got some sales. It was awesome. And then like, I got to find the next thousand people to sell this thing to. Yeah. So that was, that became, other than creating that course, I was like, okay, I got to get more subscribers. <laughs> like I've got to, if I want a launch to go well again, then and I've always kind of had ever since I, I actually used to work on Brian Harris's team and he has a course called get 10,000 subscribers. It's awesome. And so he's very, very big on, you know, email marketing, growing a list. And so that really you know, put an impression on me that that just needs to be forefront. And it's, it's just such a tangible way. I know there's other ways to grow an audience. I think, I don't think it really completely matters. I know people that do six figure launches and their entire audience is on Instagram and that's awesome, but you have to have an audience somewhere. And for me, email is just such a tangible way to see, okay, if I get this many subscribers in theory, I should be able to, you know, make this much money off of a launch. And so Even now, I still have email subscriber goals. And so I just started throwing myself into what are the best ways to get email subscribers. And I knew of somebody who had done really well using Pinterest. So I already liked to blog. So I write like long form blog content to 3000 word posts. And so I thought, well, Pinterest would probably be a good place to get eyes on those posts because most of the people buying my course now I know too are, you know, 25 to 35 year old women, which is mostly who hangs out on Pinterest. So that ended up being a really good strategy for me was to use Pinterest. And I also started a Facebook group. So most of my still most of my email subscribers come from those two sources. Okay, what's working for you on Pinterest? It's kind of been a little bit of a a struggle for me Lately, it all, it started out awesome. I learned everything I know from Rosemary Groner from busybudgeter.com, but then it kind of started to decline the first part of last year. And it's kind of been flatlining since then. It still drives plenty of traffic, but I've had to bring on a dedicated Pinterest manager. And it's like, okay, after paying her, I don't know if it's worthwhile anymore. Like what's working for you? Honestly, I paid somebody. That was where I invested my money. So I probably not the one to ask about Pinterest strategy because up until about a month ago, I don't think I knew my Pinterest login. You know, I hired somebody. That was what I did from the very beginning was I hired somebody and it has, it's continued to be, you know, I just, I check my analytics and it continues to be, it was my number one source of traffic up until about two months ago where my SEO finally started paying off. And so people are finding me more and more in search now because I've been blogging consistently for almost two years. So that's starting to pay off more, but as long as I'm still getting that traffic. And I know that I'm starting to do a little bit more where I'm creating separate landing pages for the different types of traffic. I haven't fully implemented that yet, but I want to start doing that more so I can gauge a little bit more actual email subscribers coming from Pinterest. But 
in the very beginning, that's all I did. And it got eyes on my traffic. So maybe it's more of a beginner strategy. I'm not sure. But I definitely no, know I don't that think it so. for me. Like Rosemary says, it's a search engine for content. And if you're creating yeah, content for you know people who want to be VAs, like that makes perfect sense to be over there. And when a subscriber is worth $8 and you've proven that, it's like, okay, I could, I could probably do that profitably. Tell me about your Facebook group. You mentioned the rest of the audience growth is coming from Facebook. I launched a Facebook group around the same time that I had that course idea. Of course, I when I had the $8,000 launch, I was like, I am a virtual assistant coach and I rebranded my website. I'm like, this is what I do now. And so I created a Facebook group at the time and uh, I just thought it'd be a really good way to foster community. And that group has grown to, we just crossed over the 20,000 member mark. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. I was very excited. That group really, really... What's it called if we want to check it out? It's Virtual Assistant Savvies, S-A-V-V-I-E-S. Virtual Assistant Savvies is the group. And we actually have a lot of people that come in just to hire VAs now too. So whether you are a VA, want to be a VA, or you're looking to hire somebody, it's a great place to find virtual assistants. So that group... I think a large, I was actually talking with someone the other day. They're like, how do you think your group grew so quickly? Because I didn't run ads to it. I didn't really, you know, I started pretty much from scratch. And, I and think this is a free group. Have- this is not, this is not like just for your students. This is for everybody. Exactly. Yep. It is. It's a closed group. So not, I do have to like accept the members that come in, but it's not secret. It's not open. It's just a closed group. So I think a big part of the success to the growth of that group, this is going to sound so simple, but I think it's because it has the word virtual assistant in it. I really do. Because people are searching on Facebook. Because people just people just search for things anywhere. I'm realizing like if someone wants to become a virtual assistant, they're going to search on Google. They're going to search on Pinterest. They're going to search on Instagram. They're going to search on and they would use the search bar in Facebook groups. So I was talking to someone earlier today, actually, who had who was thinking about starting a group for moms. And she had like this really cute name for her group. But I was like, you know, I would maybe think about calling your group just mom advice and community. Because I mean, really, like you can still have all the cute branding and stuff once you get to the page. But do what people are actually going to search for name your group that and I think that that actually had a big part of the group growth. It's an awesome group. It's basically that group's outgrown my email list now. So when I promote something new, I promote it in the group and promote it to my list. Okay. Do you do anything inside the group to convert those people into email subscribers? Or you say, well, they're already in the group, so I can just tell them about my stuff in here. Yeah. So I do a few things. So Facebook has the feature now where you can ask questions to people before they come into the group. So I ask them, well, we do a couple qualifying questions just to make sure like, are you a virtual assistant or looking to hire one? Please answer below. Like, what are they doing? Like, do you have a website? If so, put it here. And just so we can like make sure that they're actually not just a spammer. So because we do get those. And so any group that size for sure. Yes. (laughs) And then the third question we ask is, do you want access to our free virtual assistant checklist and starter kit? If so, put your email here. And so we actually collect emails when people join the group. They don't have to, but if they want to, they can give us their email and opt in for our freebie. So That's awesome. Is that connected automatically to ConvertKit for you or is that something that you have to do manually? It is not. It's something that we do manual. But one of the other things that I think has been, especially once the group reached 10,000 subscribers, it got a little crazy. I mean, it's almost like a Twitter feed now, how like much people are posting in that group. And I just personally, I could spend all day in there and still not answer every question. So once the group reached 10,000, we launched an ambassador program. People are so sold on this group that they wanted to give their time for free to help manage it and to help keep it a safe community. So we have six people, they commit to a quarter And so for three months, they each are assigned a day. We have every day but Sunday. And they each are assigned a day that they are in charge of the group. So they can post, they can comment, they accept. They're the ones that actually go and accept the new people because we can get up to 100 requests a day now to join the group. So they go through and then they will put that email into a landing page so that those people get their free checklist. So that's 
and they, they just do that for free. We send them a t-shirt and, you know, we make sure that we tell them that we appreciate them a lot, but people are even re-upping like after they've been an ambassador for one quarter, they want to do it again. So I think that's really helped me not to have to be, I know a lot of, Facebook groups have shut down because they just get really large and overwhelming. And I probably don't spend more than 10 minutes a day in my Facebook group. Yeah, that's really cool that people are volunteering to to help you out in there. And then, hey, you know, in exchange, they're kind of like seen as leaders in the community. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I put their pictures on our Facebook cover. So if clients do come, it's like, oh, look, these must be the really special VAs. And they are. They're awesome. So, Yeah get a little recognition. That's the Virtual Assistant Savvy's Facebook group. If you want to check it out, we should know too at the virtualsavvy.com slash hire. Abby's got a form you can fill out if you want to tap into her, you know, really huge database of qualified VAs at this point, you know, for whatever you need done. So tell me about the last couple course launches. So the audience is growing from Pinterest. The audience is growing on Facebook. This is kind of a different strategy. So I've primarily promoted the group through the podcast and a little bit through the email list and the blog, but not have no analytics on like, well, how many people are actually just typing in side? Actually, the group name doesn't have side hustle in it. It's just SH Nation on Facebook. So maybe that was a foresight that was intentional when I set it up in case people like didn't want to join a group and have their employer be like, why did you join a side hustle group? But (laughs) maybe, maybe I'm missing out on some search traffic there. But tell me about your recent launches. Now the course is already created, you know, what's changed during that launch sequence and how did those go? Yeah. So I relaunched the course after I had an $8,000 launch in December of 2016. I, you know, threw the money I made from that into really like my Pinterest marketing and, you know, I kept blogging. So I grew my list to about 4,000 subscribers by my next launch. Well, that was in, I think, June of 2017. And at that point, I launched again. And I did a $40,000 launch, 40,000 in sales, which blew my mind. <laughs> um, from, from a 4,000 person list. Mm-hmm. So my course is 997. So when people buy, it's a pretty big purchase. It's a big commitment, but it's a all in one, like literally start a business. It's almost like you're buying into a franchise, except I don't take their money afterwards. It's like, here's everything you need to start a business. So I think that that may attribute to some of that higher sales. And then I doubled my list size by my next launch. And at that point, I had 8,000 people on my list. So I was thinking, okay, I'm probably not going to double. So maybe like 70,000 is what I should guess for. And that was a hundred and sixty thousand dollar launch, and Whoa. I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> what do you think contributed to that? To four exit from a list that had only grown by double, and and half of the people had already heard of the program and chose not to buy. Yeah, I think a lot of success stories started coming out. So a lot of, and I did a lot of featuring my success stories. So I let other people see these people were able to quit their jobs or they were, you know, they got their first client in the first week. And we featured a few of them on my blog during the actual launch. So I do like a, like a seven day launch during the launch. A couple of my students that really, really believed in the course popped into like my Facebook group and they would do their own live streams about how much they loved the course. And I think there was a lot of like brand loyalty with my current students. I really, really tried to pay a lot of attention to them. So if I'm spending 10 minutes in my big group, I'm going to spend 20, 30 minutes in my tighter knit community because I want them to get a lot of attention. And so I make sure that my students succeed. And I think that that really like maybe boiled over, I guess. (laughs) Part of me is still like, how did that happen? But I think that that probably had a lot to do with it. Yeah, that's really cool. That's incredible results. And yeah, it's awesome that people are seeing results you know, from the program, of course, and then they become advocates, they become testimonials for you. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah, it was amazing. I was, to be honest, that week was very stressful. I launches are always crazy. I literally had a panic attack, like went to urgent care, thought I was having a heart attack, not like when I saw the numbers, just like the stress of the launch. And so I have since put things in place that I don't do a new launch, like every single time, like I thought I had to create new content every time. So I was like, coming up with a whole new masterclass and a whole new this and all. Mm -mm, Not anymore. Like I literally do the exact same launch every time now. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. So because if it's every six months, I feel like people, 
people have almost like forgotten the content or, or it's going to be right for the people at that time that it's right for. So I don't stress myself out with, I mean, I'll tweak a few little things. I'll exchange testimonials, put some new updates and things in there, but I don't try to create a whole new launch every time now. I'm just basically doing the, the same launch and it's continuing to get results. So yes, don't let yourself get so stressed. Yeah. So the material is already recorded. Like that's, you know, all kind of on autopilot. Are you sending people just to a teachable landing page for the checkout? Yep. So my sales page is in teachable. And then uh, we're just now switching our checkout page to Sam cart, just so I can have all of my other products and everything in one place. And we can start setting up a better affiliate program. Okay. Lately, it sounds like you've been transitioning from this open and shut launch to more of an evergreen model. Can you tell me about that? Or, or am I mistaken on that? So part of me having this huge launch was realizing that it was very stressful to just make a lot of money two times a year. So I started toying with the idea of doing an evergreen model. I actually have a business coach now that really suggested it. So I'm going to continue to do launches because we're just systematizing them more. And I think it is really awesome to have like a big time twice a year where people can get in. But I have implemented a kind of evergreen. So kind of behind the scenes all the time. If someone goes to my website and I promote a free training and in that free training, if you're watching it for the first time, you'll get a one-time offer to purchase the course. So that way people finding me for the very first time, if they just missed the launch and they go to this free training, they can still get the course at that time. So I started doing that pretty much right after my last launch. And so I've been doing that for a couple of months now. And so that's really starting to pick up steam as well. So a lot of people will go to my site, get the free training, they watch a a pre-recorded basically webinar. And at the end of it, they have the option to buy the course at that time. Okay. Is that just like a YouTube video or how does that work? It is just a YouTube video. (laughs) It's a YouTube video just embedded in like a landing page, something like the funnels or lead pages or whatever you're using. That's what you would do it in. Okay. So that has a couple benefits. It smooths out your revenue curve, makes makes life a little bit less stressful relying on these two big launches a year. (laughs) But it also serves, in my opinion, serves visitors better, serves clients better because I don't want to wait. If I missed it, I don't want to wait six months to learn this stuff. If I'm ready to go now, like I want to start now. Right. You know, and one of the things that I did is I mapped out my customer journey. So from like the moment somebody finds out about me, what do they need all the way to like, what's my ending point? Like, where do I say, okay, it's best for you to go buy someone else's course or do something else. And I had to map that out. And I realized that you know, I'm really good at getting people from not even knowing what a VA is starting completely from scratch to being able to like quit their jobs. And so, but what do they need in the very beginning? The very first thing they need is that my boot camp course. So why make them wait for six months to get it if they're ready to start now? So I have that option now. And then I do have a couple of other products that, you know, once they've purchased that, that it may be good for them to do to up level their skills. But then at a certain point, I also say, okay, like now if you want to create an online course, I don't teach people how to do that. Go take somebody else's course. And so I think it's good to like map out like what is your customer journey? Because if you're trying to serve everybody's need at every point in their journey, it's just going to get overwhelming. And so I have very specifically like, this is what I teach. I will get you from here to here. And if you're before that or you're after that, then there's probably other people who could better serve you. Yeah, very cool, man. I'm I'm excited with what you built and really kind of accelerated things in the last year, last year and a half, really. So kind of cool to see where this is going. Um, what's next for you? What else is on the horizon for the rest of this year and, and beyond? Like, So two big things. One, I, well, we're buying a house. <laughs> That's just a personal thing, but I'm very excited to actually like physically see some of the fruits of my labor in that sense. Very nice. Congrats. <laughs> I know. I'm very excited. I think I talk to my audience a lot about having like flip the switch goals. Like you can be like, I want to have more time with my kids. I was like, that's really hard to know, like the moment it happens. But like, for me, the moment we like sign the deed to this house, it's like we own a house and that's a goal achieved. So very excited for that. I want to do a million dollars in profit. That will probably take 
two to three years for me to get there. But I like have it. And I really also later this year, I'm going to do a personal big shift that I want to start giving more. Like I just, I want to find a way to really give back. I have a huge heart for foster care and teen moms, which is not entirely related to this at all. But I really want to find a way to use what I'm doing to help that community. Well, very cool. I have no doubt that you're going to get there if you continue down this path. The virtualsavvy.com is where you can find more about Abby and everything she is doing. You can check out all of her lead magnets or opt-ins. You'll definitely dive into some of the stuff that she's got going on over there. She's done, I think she's gone about it in a very smart way. Again, the virtualsavvy.com. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Don't be afraid to shit before it's perfect. Um, ship with a P. <laughs> I, I think that we just wait until we have enough money or all the tools, but just go, just do it. And if it fails, that's okay. Switch your tactic and do it again. And I think that that's, that would be my number one tip. Ship before it's perfect. Perfection is the enemy of good enough. Abby, appreciate you joining me. We'll catch up with you soon. Thank you. What's the most important skill for entrepreneurs and side hustlers? I used to think it was creativity. After all, you've got to create something before you can go out and find customers. But lately, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the most important skill is actually the meta skill of learning new skills. And that's where today's sponsor, Skillshare.com, comes in. Skillshare is the online learning platform with now more than 20,000 classes taught by practicing experts. On Skillshare, you can learn everything from video editing to social media marketing to ebook formatting to Google AdWords. There's a huge variety of subject matter on pretty much anything you'd want to learn. The bite-sized classes are perfect for professionals who want to advance their career and for side hustlers who want to expand the skills you need to grow your business. How it works is you get unlimited access to all these classes for a low monthly price. You never have to pay per class again. I like to say it's like Netflix, only for something that'll actually help your business. It's all on demand, and the catalog has some pretty awesome stuff. And the best part is, Side Hustle Show listeners can try Skillshare for two months for just 99 cents. I think you're going to love it. Visit Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle to get started today. That's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle for two months of unlimited access for just 99 cents. All right, my top takeaways from this call with Abby. Number one is to go for it. I've been asking a lot of entrepreneurs lately, you know, what gave you the confidence to do X, Y, Z? And the answers from the people who are seeing the best results are all kind of strikingly similar. I just went for it. I I knew I just had to put myself out there or I just knew I could figure it out as I went. And I think Abby exemplifies that spirit of just going for it. She didn't second guess if she was qualified to do the work uh, as, as a virtual assistant or if she was expert enough to teach others how to get started in this business or if she did second guess herself, she was able to suppress that thought long enough to take action. Takeaway number one, go for it. Takeaway number two is to build that list. Even her initial list of 800 to 1,000 people for that pre-sale launch, that didn't happen by accident. That's a lot of people, you know? It took me a year of pretty consistent effort to reach those kind of numbers. And I should note, um, too, that it doesn't all have to happen online either, because I actually met Abby in a bar it sounds a little bit weird to tell it, but you know, she was on her way out. I noticed her t-shirt said something about virtual assistants. So I asked, hey, you know, what's that about? This was during uh, Traffic and Conversion Summit down in San Diego. So it wasn't like completely random, but you know, we chatted for a bit and connected after the conference. And I was really impressed with her business. But that connection started because of her t-shirt. You never know when these conversations are going to start and what they might lead to. Like I found another uh, a new listener for the podcast the other day. Uh, shout out if you're tuning in right now. When the checkout guy at Trader Joe's asked me about my hashtag podcaster t-shirt. So building that list, making those connections doesn't always have to happen online, but it is something that we've got to prioritize. Takeaway number three is to pre-sell with real dollars. Don't ask if somebody would buy, but instead ask them to buy. Now, historically, I have been not so awesome at this. My usual plan, and maybe this sounds familiar, is to toil away in silence for months and months, you know, building something almost in speculation, and then to see if it's something that the market wants. But if I hear it enough times from my guests, I think I can get on board with the uh, pre-sale validation idea for some upcoming projects. Build it and they'll come, might work in the movies, but in real life, I think it's pretty risky. Instead, be like Abby and ask people to buy up front, and then you'll have the validation that you need and the motivation to build the thing. Or, or not, if people don't buy it, that's fine too. It just means you gotta come back, uh, come back to the table with a different offer. 
So be sure to hit up sidehustlenation.com slash Abby, again, A-B-B-E-Y, to download the free PDF highlight reel with all of Abby's top tips from this episode. And if you like what you hear on the Side Hustle Show, hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app to make sure you never miss an episode. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show, where you'll meet a friend of mine who has set up his service business for recurring passive income. And he says you can do the same. I'll see you then. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com.